Today's guest is Dan Iveson. Uh, Dan is the group CIO of PIMCO. Dan has been at PIMCO since 1998. I'm sitting here in beautiful Newport Beach at PIMCO's headquarters. They were kind enough to invite me here uh, in their beautiful studio. Uh, so thanks for having me, Dan, and uh, thank you for joining me. Thanks, uh, look forward to the, uh, the discussion today. Me too. Let's go back to the beginning. Uh, what originally sparked your passion for investing and were you always on the fixed income side or did you start somewhere else? Yeah, so I'll go way back. Um, and I'm, I'm not quite sure what what piqued my interest uh, in general, but back when I was a rather young child, uh, back in uh, a small town in central Massachusetts, I used to listen to uh, a gentleman named Bruce Williams. He had a, uh, you may remember, a, a financial planning show, mm -hmm. um, probably a little bit of an odd child, you know, back back then. You know, sports and other activities, but at night I'd throw that on and uh, it was just good old fashioned, you know, financial planning, you know, type type stuff. So for whatever reason, I gained an interest way back then, went and got a degree in economics, uh, a minor in anthropology, you know, um, offered Occidental, you know, in, in terms of my undergraduate uh, education. And then over the years, you know, got involved in in finance um, with an eye towards fixed income, or, or at least for whatever reason, I, I, I like the idea of uh, cash flows and analyzing cash flows. I look at what people do in the VC space or tech investing where um, you don't have much of a cash flow anchor. And I think that stuff's quite quite tricky. But for whatever reason, I, I had an interest in uh, in fixed income. And then when I went back to business school, that really solidified my interest. And I, I guess the rest was history in, 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 uh, in that respect. It's interesting uh, you, how you contrast fixed income and let's say equities and things that are less or more difficult to uh, underwrite. Would you go into that a little bit more? Because I think that also feeds into maybe the way you think about investing in general. Yeah. So, you know, my background is, has always been in uh, structured products, asset-backed securities, asset-backed investing, which is uh, very cash flow driven, uh, especially within uh, the fixed income opportunity set. So um, when you when you look at, you know, the different styles of investing, um, fixed income, um, I, I guess it's more complicated in some respects. But in others, it's fairly straightforward because uh, the coupon, uh, the yield you earn, um, other than in the distress space, and I've been you know involved in those areas as you know as well, uh, it's, it's a pretty good predictor of the general range of what you're going to earn uh, over a longer term holding period. So that is an important anchor. And again, um, what's nice is there is this inherent predictability uh, because you are getting that coupon back, and then you hope you ultimately get your principal back. And in certain investments, you get a little bit more than that. You at times as well, so it's a different style of investing. Um, it's 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 one you know that that feels maybe a bit more like engineering, or other types of you know maybe more mathematical or scientific analysis than um, the type of investing you know the very talented folks do again in the venture capital space, the growth equity space. But um, it's what for whatever reason I you know became comfortable with. I was always a little bit better in math and in, in some of those. Uh, endeavors that I were in more maybe creative areas. So uh, I'm, I guess I'm glad I'm, I'm, I'm here doing what I'm doing and uh, we'll leave some of that other stuff uh, to other real, real talented folks with slightly different uh, different perspectives. That's very interesting. Uh, you've been at PIMCO for 26 years. Uh, what is it about the culture of this firm uh, that has kept you here for so long and has helped you thrive and succeed? Yes, I, I love the place. Um, and uh, you know, that's been true throughout my career. Um, demanding place, uh, demanding mentors, bosses, uh, peers. Uh, but that really is 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 the the, the single biggest attraction. Um, great people, but great people with a you know passionate client focus. We're not as much of a marketing oriented firm as some. Uh, we're almost entirely active asset managers, whether you're talking about the public or the private side of our business. So although we're large, um, we're fairly simple um, in terms of our, our focus and our approach. And despite the fact that um, we've grown a lot um, during my, my time here at the firm, uh, the place has always felt small. Um, there's a degree of informality here. We all know each other pretty well. Um, and, and again, tremendous respect for my colleagues. Um, they're all uh, uh, quite smart, quite hardworking. And, and again, that, that client focus at the end of the day is what's so much, um, so, so important. Um, and and, again, and there, there's such a huge advantage to being in a place that's a magnet for talent and for really smart people that are hardworking. Because when you surround yourself with people like that, they help you raise your game. 
Otherwise, you get swallowed up pretty fast. I agree with that. And investing, contrary to sometimes you know perceptions, you know when you when you're you know watching you know various you know financial news networks, it's it's, it's a team sport. Um, people like myself in a higher pro- profile role may get more credit, or there may be you know the perception that it's it's more about select individuals than it is team. But it is a a team sport. Uh, we've always been large, global, and, and and very very focused on that fixed income opportunity set, but. You know, to your point, you know, you know, great people, you know, even people that can be quirky and demanding and, and, and difficult at times, you know, still lead to just, you know, great um, job satisfaction, especially if you're well aligned with uh, the interests of the end clients. So it's it's maybe not for everyone. Um, you know, I think there are lots of different cultures out there and approaches to adding value, but it's been one that's worked for myself, my colleagues, and uh, you know, I've been around now uh I guess almost 26 years, um, maybe, you know, the, a group of the people that have been here the longest, but there's still some uh, old timers I work with every day. Mark Kiesel was here 28 years that um, oversees credit for us. Chris Dialinus, who I just saw coming down the stairs, um, has been here uh, and was here, you know, uh, well, you know for a decade longer, um, you know, th- than I've been. So it's, it, it's, it's fun. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, I, I think, important in a career. Now, before we get into fixed income and and your market outlook, uh, what would you say are some major investment lessons you've learned personally over the last 30 plus years uh, that have shaped the way you think about investing in your investment philosophy? Yeah. Well, well there's, there's uh, as you can imagine, a, a lot there. I'll, I'll, I'll toss out a, a few. What is risk management? Um, risk management is critically important, and I don't mean that in a defensive sense, but trying to understand what can go wrong uh, within a portfolio, especially in areas where it's almost impossible to course correct, uh, is is critically important. It may be the less fun aspect of the role, but it's really important not to just think about, you know, your base case outlook for markets, but try to think about what can go wrong and try to find mechanisms that can help you assess what can go wrong even though it may not be overly intuitive. The intuitive stuff, the stuff that, you know, where you've had prior experience isn't the stuff that can be the most damaging. So I think that's point number one. It's the yeah. surprises that really matter. That's absolutely right. And, and that's true in, in a market context uh, as, as, as well. Uh, the second relates to patience. And I think this is critically important. Um, and, and you know this, um, you know, in, in, in terms of your activities in this market. Um, although we try to have a longer term horizon, we try to convince our clients, our partners to have a longer term horizon, uh, inevitably the horizons are too short. Um, the way we're measured, the way that we tend to think about returns. I joke that I have a long-term focus, yet I run home every night and I look at my NAV and see how much it changed. Um, and the trend seems to be going the other way. Absolutely right. And, I, and that was going to be my, my other point now with um, with X and other you know social mm-hmm. media, you're just inundated with um, short-term information and data. Data is everywhere. So the temptation is to be even more shorter term oriented than um, you would have been in the past. But I think patience is important as an active asset manager. Um, making the active decision to do nothing and sit back and wait is sometimes the hardest decision, uh, but it's also very, very important. And related to that fact, um, and my colleague and mentor, Scott Simon, who used to run mortgages for us, um, you know, used to say this to me all the time, uh, you got to take what the market gives you. And you need to, particularly in frothy markets, be willing to say no, be willing to be average or even below average over the short term, because the willingness to be below average when you have a mindset that you shouldn't be taking a lot, the correct mindset that you shouldn't be taking a lot of risk, sets you up for success in the future. So you're not going to perform as well as your clients need you to perform if you're fixated on being top of the board from a performance perspective each quarter, even each year. Um, and I think that's hard to do because um, a lot of the incentive structures um, that are in place, manager of the year, um, top 10, top, you know, bottom 10 list, um, the bonus cycle, um, and this is something we focus on a lot at PIMCO, trying to um, uh, align um, incentives with our clients and focus on you know, three-year, five-year rolling type returns. Um, but it's hard. And I think the longer you do this, um, I, I think the, the, the more patient you, you can become. But I think that's also a very, very uh, important lesson I tell the, uh, the younger folks all the time. And then, of course, humility and, and position sizing are, I guess, aspects of risk management that I think are uh, particularly important as well. What you just said is one of the things that I've learned by talking to great investors and contrasting the ones that have been around a long time versus the ones that are newer in the industry. And I feel that the ones that are around longer tend to have greater humility 
and a, an appreciation that they're going to be wrong more often than maybe they thought they would have been you know, earlier in their careers. And that, I guess, comes from experience. Yeah, I, th- I think so. I, although we, we, we try to have mechanisms in place to protect ourselves from our own tendencies as well. So I think in general, that's right. But I think, you know, overconfidence is an area that um, continues to plague myself. I sometimes go home and I, you know, I'll have a bit of an epiphany at night and think I, you know, have some, some, some grand insight. And I, I think, you know, you, 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 you get a good night's sleep, you settle in, you, you talk about it. And yeah, you may have a good perspective, but I think it's important to anchor those views to, you know, an objective process and to protect against that, that, um, that type of thing. So, um, yeah, these are all things we think about. And then again, what's great about, uh, this business again, it's not PIMCO specific is that, um, you know, even if you think you've gotten it figured out, the markets change paradigm shifts, new people in policy seats, um, other shocks, um, to growth, inflation and so on. So it, it's, it's a great business because things change all the time and you have to adapt and, uh, it'd be willing, you know, willing, willing, willing to adapt. I guess that's where the younger folks come in, where they have some advantages that we do when we start talking about this AI stuff and tech innovation and, uh, and things of that sort that are going to be quite important in terms of how you uh, deploy capital over time. That's right. Let's talk about the fixed income market. Uh, you've been involved for several decades. How has that market evolved over the last 20, 30 years? Yeah, so it's, um, in general, uh, it's become more global. Um, you've seen growth in capital markets outside the developed world, outside the United States, grow at a greater pace. There's been a decent amount of uh, financial innovation. So, you know, more types of risk get transferred through the markets um, today than they did, you know, 20, 25 years ago. But also, you know, there's been a little bit, particularly over the last few years, or I think you can go all the way back to the GFC of, you um, you know, heading back to the to the past a little bit. I, I think, you know, liquidity, you know, today is not as good as it was at its peak maybe 10, 15 years ago. We're not quite back to the 80s or the early 90s before a lot of these markets developed. But with a lot of the post-global financial crisis regulation, uh, it's made it a little bit harder to transfer risk um, for intermediaries to step in and, and, and make markets. So, you know, you tend to have, I think, cycles. And, and in some sense, over the last few years, it does feel like we've we've gotten back to, to, to periods earlier in the career. But I think in general, markets have become more global, more data-driven. Um, I think in a local sense, they've become more efficient. But perhaps in a broader sense, uh, there's more frictions or more inefficiencies or more periods where to clear markets, markets have to overshoot fundamentals, or you have market participants that are quite large um, and, and, and in some case larger than the banks that used to be the, 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 the biggest players that make decisions for non-economic reasons, um, capital optimization, maximizing yield per unit of capital, things that aren't total return focused. So um, I, I think the biggest and obvious changes throughout my 25 years at PIMCO is that it's become a more technical market, more global market, more interrelated global market, uh, more data-driven, locally more efficient, but where you know liquidity is uh, certainly time-varying, fleeting um, at, at moments in, in time and where um, overshooting does occur because of this lack of intermediation. And that presents, again, a great opportunity for active asset managers that are on sides and have prepared for you know, these, you know, higher frequency bouts of, uh, of, of, of volatility and at least a little bit of strain in, uh, in markets. You mentioned market efficiency. There's a school of thought that equities, public equities are relatively efficient because there's information everywhere. Um, would you talk about fixed income efficiency? Yeah. You touched on a little bit. And are there pockets within the world of fixed income where there's generally less efficiency, more opportunity? Yeah. So I, I, you know, fixed income markets are, are, are much less efficient. And, um, and and why is that? Well, I think you, you have um, you're not trading on an exchange. You have much less uh, information flow. Um, you have um, more inherent complexity. Uh, any one fixed income investment could have documentation. You know that's you know hundreds and hundreds of, of pages long. Um, you literally have thousands and thousands of different instruments that trade, all with very very unique cash flow characteristics, very unique um, documentation. Um, you know, even when you look at a corporate cap structure, you tend to have common stock and then um, a full range of maturities and um, you know different you know types of investments across you know increasingly complex cap structures. Uh, today, you have you know varying quality of documentation. 
um, some very good and in, 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 in strictly rules based, some with significant um, uncertainty and in, in, in flexibility on, on how cash flow priority can change. So it's a much more complex market. I think, you know, you know, to your question as to where there's the most inefficiency, it tends to be, you know, newer markets, less stable and established markets, um, the emerging markets, um, you know, you know, newer um, growth markets outside the United States, then areas where there is uh, increased complexity, um, structured products, you know, some of the real estate markets, some of the areas within the corporate opportunity set that are a little bit less generic, um, you know, I, I think offers the most opportunities. Then also outside the sectors is the, the point I mentioned earlier. Um, with all the regulation that has been put in place, particularly since the global financial crisis impacting banks, insurance companies, um, other large entities, and the fact that we're a world still heavily regulated based on rating agency um, ratings, that creates lots of frictions as well, where unlike you know the equity markets where typically people can buy the common stocks on the exchange they want to buy, maybe it's segregated by you know the S&P 500 opportunity set or the NASDAQ opportunity set, um, you know, in our space, there's huge uh, restrictions just tied to a somewhat arbitrary rating made by some outside third party. And whether you get two ratings versus one ratings can further restrict uh, the buyer base. So you have lots of, you know, institutional frictions, market segmentation, and all of that can be exploited. And in fact, you know, I think that's the key to sustainable, repeatable alpha generation is um, we, we leave the, you know, the, the duration forecast or the Fed forecast you know, maybe later in the discussion, it's these types of inefficiencies in markets that are the key, I think, to successful active asset management. The rest can help supplement those returns, but you want to have a keen focus on those frictions because uh, that's the low-hanging fruit, uh, so to speak, and there's still plenty of it out there in, uh, in the market today. Well, why don't we transition to your market outlook? Uh, and let's, let's start with the very big picture. Uh, and we, if we look at the federal deficit and the, the growing debt uh, trajectory, it's on an unsustainable path. Uh, it's going to end at some point, who knows when. Um, what is your sense about what the long-term implications of that is on the U.S. dollar, on interest rates, on ultimately the world reserve currency status yeah. that the U.S. currently holds? Uh, how do you think about all that? Well, to your point, it's not sustainable. Um, so to the extent that we continue to run mid-single-digit type deficits in good times, which could quickly turn into high single digit or even low You're supposed to run digit. a surplus during good times. Exactly. So you can save for a rainy day. Absolutely right. So this is quite um, unusual from a historical perspective. Now, you know, we can get away with it. We have a uh, economy where, at least for the time being, there's a lot of, you know, global confidence, um, you know, in our, you know, ability to, 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 to grow. And, you know, we have a lot of tech innovation, you know, you know, here, you know, within our, our market. Um, and we still are the global reserve currency without an obvious alternative over the near term. So we can, as, as my colleague, Paul McCullough used to say, can afford to be, you know, you know, far more irresponsible than others. And we tend to do it almost gleefully, which again is a, a bit of a concern. But when you step back and look at historically at other countries with similar debt levels or debt service costs, there's some hope. Um, no one's concerned about the deficit at, at the moment. In fact, um, you know, when you hear, you know, um, either Democrats or Republicans talk, it's it, it's usually more spending. Uh, they 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 have different philosophies on how to spend, um, with very very little focus there. But when you look back through history, you know, we're near a point where um, you're getting to either absolute debt levels or debt service costs where. You know, triggers can occur within the political system where people begin to take this more seriously. Um, now, as a fixed income investor, um, you know, we, we we do focus on the history books, and there is therefore some hope um, that we could get our deficits in order. But the longer we stay in this type of position, the more we're going to have to pay on our debt. And I think not only is it a concern over the long term, you know, one of the reasons why real rates um, are as high as they are and will likely stay higher than they were pre-COVID is the fact that we are running uh, at higher debt levels uh, and, and higher deficit levels. Now, as investors like us, um, getting a positive real return on, you know, government bonds isn't a bad thing. Um, you know, in, in some sense, uh, you know, the government's forced to pay us a higher return to, to, to own these instruments. So uh, in general, we think that these deficits are manageable over the short to intermediate term. But at some point, the market's going to, again, provide the U.S. government a reminder that um, this, this isn't sustainable. Dollar's another example. Um, 
you know, this is a situation where over the long term, it would likely lead to at least all else equal dollar weakness. Um, again, there's some positives. You know, we have very, very high real interest rates. We have a vibrant uh, and innovative tech sector. So over the short term, these fiscal issues will likely be masked or overwhelmed by some positives supporting the dollar. But we do think over the longer term, um, if we don't see some improvement here, um, the dollar will be set uh, to weaken. Uh, real quickly, what are we doing about it? Um, the great news is um, there are other developed markets in the world that have similar yields or even higher yields versus the United States. They actually have more fragile economies at the moment. So not only do they offer an attractive yield or income on a hedge basis, even higher incremental returns, you may even get better price appreciation because you have a little bit more cyclical weakness in those economies. And you've already seen some central banks outside the US cut more, but it is nice because a lot of those countries um, that have attractive yields uh, and maybe even you know better near-term return potential um, are balancing their budgets or are a lot closer to balancing their budgets than the United States. So all else equal, you know, we are looking at um, certain opportunities outside the U.S. Uh, within the developed market opportunity set, not just because of concerns on the fiscal side, but as good prudent credit investors, it's better to loan to a government that's balancing their books than one that's not. And I would expect that other countries or investors around the globe will begin to shift in that direction if we don't get things under control. And when we go back a few years, the Fed rapidly hiked interest rates five plus percent, uh, fastest rate hikes in 40 years. And most people expected a recession as a result of that. And here we are a couple years later, you, you've had an inverted yield curve, which is a good predictor of recessions, the post hikes, and yet still no sign of a recession. Is this time really different? Well, maybe. Um, it, 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 and it probably is. And it almost certainly is in the sense that um, the events over the last few years are quite exceptional. Um, global pandemic, um, the sudden stop of the global economy, a, a freezing of supply chains, uh, a freezing of the way that we all lived our lives. Uh, and then an unprecedented monetary and, and fiscal policy response where our central bank was buying credit assets and you know we had you know a 25% of GDP type stimulus. So there's a lot going on, uh, both on the demand and the supply side. And I think you know we, we, you know, we expected to see more economic weakening uh, in response to the policy uh, response as well. Now I think it's important to note though, although uh, the Fed's taken you know you know rates up to you know um, the mid five percent type range. Uh, the fiscal side has remained quite uh, accommodative. And um, there's still remnants of the prior fiscal stimulus left, you know, flowing through the economy as, 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 as well. So, you know, in some sense, the, the, the monetary tightening was, and they won't frame it this way necessarily, but partially to offset the big, the big fiscal side. But I think what we're learning, and we're going to need a few more years to look back and, 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 and assess the data trends, was that a lot of this was somewhat transitory. If you expand your transitory definition out, uh, a not few a few years, months, but a few years, a few years, and you know the supply side certainly mattered, perhaps more than some people thought. So again, this was a demand and a supply side phenomenon. But as you see uh, inflation uh, recede, with growth holding up even in the face of higher rates, it does appear that th this was a fairly unique underlying shock. Now, with that said, we haven't had the recession yet but inflation is not to target yet. These higher rates are beginning to impact key segments of the economy. Other areas of, of the market likely much less um, rate sensitive than they've been in the past. US housing, absolutely incredible. And, and, and again, another example of how unique the cycle was. Um, since the GFC, we've become a 95% fixed rate mortgage market. Not fixed for five or 10 years, like many countries outside the US, but fixed for 30 years. So although mortgage rates are hovering somewhere around the 7% range, no one's paying 7%. The vast majority of households locked in a rate well below 4%. So just an example of how unique we um, this cycle was in terms of a massive drop in rates, a lock-in of these very, very low fixed rates, and then the upswing of the Fed trying to slow the economy. And the U.S. housing market is probably the most obvious example of that dynamic. It's true across the corporate sector as well, at least within the investment grade and the high yield space. So bottom line is, you know, good chance of a soft landing. We're not out of the woods yet. Um, we still get a little bit more work to do. And the inverted curve, although it's less inverted, um, still should be something that you know, we're still thinking about. Um, you know, the probability of a, of a, of a harder landing scenario, we, we think is still a little bit higher than what the market currently uh, currently thinks it is. One thing that is 
pretty different today is you could argue it's a new regime. If you just think about the last 40 years, you were either in a falling rate environment or a near zero rate environment. And today it seems like we've shifted to a higher for longer type of regime. Uh, how do you think about everything you just talked about within that new regime and how does that change things? Yeah, well, that, that's probably correct. I, I, and, and when we look at the world today, you know, you probably have higher neutral real rates. You probably have a little bit higher structural inflation, you know, or, or steady state inflation than you had pre-COVID. You probably have more inflation volatility or symmetry than you had, you know, pre-COVID. Now you have an economic shock. Um, there's still some decent room for, you know, policymakers to, to reduce rates and certain type of shocks could be deflationary in nature, particularly with the debt loads um, that, that, that are out there. So we do think the world is probably different how different we don't know for sure. Now, the great news is this, is that when, um, and it's, it's funny, you know, it, after 2022, people seem to yearn for the old days, but the old days were very well-behaved inflation, typically, you know, below central bank targets, but with no real rates uh, compensation. So as fixed income investors, yeah, yeah, you had a nicely, you know, behaved um, inflationary world, um, but you had no yield. Um, whatever yield you had when you subtracted that low inflation rate usually ended up with a negative number. And then outside the US, you didn't even have to subtract anything, you had a negative number. So I think what's great today is that you don't need price appreciation to generate a strong return within fixed income. And back to our earlier conversation um, in, in terms of fixed income investing being a bit more straightforward than that other stuff. Uh, when you're looking at a high quality bond portfolio uh, and you look at, returns over a three to five year period, the yield is a good reasonable floor on what you're going to earn. Um, so today, when you look at, you know, a, a popular benchmark, um, you know, Bloomberg Ag, you're getting close to a, you know, five-ish percent return, give or take. If you hold that for three to five years, that's typically what you earn. And if you make a few thoughtful asset allocation shifts along the way, you generate a little bit of alpha, well, you can get some more incremental returns. So I think, although we are in a new world today, um, after the sell-off we've seen the last few years, we do think current pricing provides cushion in terms of real rates being higher, term premium being higher, inflation being higher. So more uncertainty over the short term, um, but pretty good value for investors that are looking out three years, five years in, in, in time and not relying on um, the type of positive price performance that we got used to during um, you know many years um, you know, leading up to the COVID period. And as a fixed income investor, you're obviously very focused on default rates because uh, that's how you can not get your yield that, that you're promised. Um, so how do you think about the risk that default rates surprise to the upside given the new regime of higher for longer? Because if you look backwards, anytime there's economic weakness, you get a cut in rates and it's easier to refinance and so on. But if rates stay higher for longer, what does that do to default rates? Yeah, the, uh, the longer we stay at these higher real rates, um the more pressure there is on the economy and uh, particularly the rate sensitive sectors. Uh, plus we live in a highly uncertain world where that growth shock can happen um, outside the financial space. Um, COVID being a good example of that, there's plenty of geopolitical uh, risks that could flare up that could, 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 could create that type of dynamic as well. So, you know, bottom line is um, we haven't had a recession in a long time and we had the mini recession, policymakers didn't let it last for long. A massive fiscal and monetary um, response. We may not get that same response. It's harder to get that response given the inflationary period we've gone through and the fact that the politics aren't nearly as favorable towards a big policy response. Uh, also with higher debt levels, just less uh, fiscal flexibility um, to address um, any type of negative growth shocks. So we'll have a recession again. Um, and when that occurs, there'll be higher credit losses. Now, defaults are quite interesting. Um, normally, it flows through to defaults. But in this covenant light world we live in, uh, within some of the lower quality areas of the credit markets, particularly the loan space and even now you know, the, the private credit space, it may not be a default, but it could be a credit loss through structurings outside of bankruptcy. But the bottom line is that when you look at the last 15 years or so, you had consumer credit sectors massively regulated coming out of COVID, um, where despite the fact that now, again, it's 15 years um, in the past, uh, the regulation has been so strict. It's so hard to extend credit to anyone other than the highest credit quality borrowers in these areas. Documentation, when you go to refi your mortgage, if you remember, it's about this thick. It's ironic that, you know, but this much documentation to get a new mortgage, 
when the covenant package on, you know, a single B corporate entity, you know, in the loan space or now even in the private credit space is about this thick in terms of precautions. So uh, we do think that's where there's some excess that's building up, where there's some complacency. So when you have that recession, we do think that there's going to be some disappointment. I also think that you need to make the distinction between the fixed rate and the floating rate credit markets. Uh, mentioned earlier, a lot of investment grade names, a lot of high yield companies locked in longer term fixed rate um, liabilities or debt during the low yielding environment. Uh, when you look at the high yield corporate bond market today, defined as you know mostly the fixed rate segment, uh, much higher quality, lower leverage than it's been in the past, with a lot of the more aggressive lending migrating into loans, migrating into the private credit space. So I think you have to make that distinction where there's been um, significant growth, arguably concerning growth, where you have floating rate risk, feeling the full brunt of central bank policy rates. I think that's where you have the greater risks if you had some type of earnings shock or uh, or recessionary type outcome, especially if it's stagflationary in uh, in nature. Don't want to sound overly alarmist, but I think that's the least interesting area in the area where um, investors may be the most surprised um, in terms of credit losses being um, at least a, a bit higher than they anticipate. If you have enough of a recession, it could be uh, quite the downgrade in, uh, in, in, in loss cycle there. You touched on the Fed's reaction function. So if you go back 30, 40 years, Whenever there was an economic downturn, they'd be very quick to cut rates, and that's gotten quicker over time. Um, do you feel that in, in an environment where inflation is sticky, it's staying higher for, for longer than most people anticipated, including the Fed, and maybe their reaction function is going to be more constrained because they don't want to stoke inflation again? Is that more analogous to the 1970s if anybody's looking for a historical period? Yeah, I, I think you go back to the 70s, you, you can even go back to, 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 to prior periods where we're you know, there were more modest, but still, you know, inflation pressures there in the marketplace. I think the big difference today is that you have much higher debt stock around the globe, which also reduces overall flexibility and it can create some monetary policy challenges. You're seeing it with the Bank of Japan right now. They're in a bit of a predicament because they want to remain accommodative, but they want to keep real rates low given the massive debt stock. But the market's telling them, hey, you know, you can't do this uh, much longer necessarily unless you want some 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 problems with your currency. So we think that there'll still be a will in terms of central banks trying to be active to help engineer positive economic outcomes. The real question is, will they be effective? Will markets let them? Because if you begin, if you're concerned about inflation and inflation expectations, then uh, markets and the economy, by extension, doesn't necessarily respond as favorably as it has in the past to these significant uh, interest rate cuts. So we think that the central banks and other fiscal agents will be more careful in providing accommodation because of higher debt levels and the inflationary experience that we've 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 gone through. We also think that there's a risk, um, and maybe it's a tail risk, um, but it's still a meaningful risk that markets don't respond as policymakers hope. So we think both of those are significant risks. Now, there's other interesting questions now too, with a cleaner banking system when, and with a lot of the more economically sensitive and aggressive risk being transferred out uh, into the you know non-regulated sectors and segments of the market, there may be less of a direct desire or, or, or pressure to react if the problems um, are emanating out of the banking system. That's sort of a separate you know, side note. But bottom line is, yeah, whatever probability you had of policymakers coming to the rescue in the past, you should take those probabilities lower uh, and therefore be a bit more defensive in terms of mindset as to what a recession and what the resulting investment performance could be if you got into that type of uh, underlying environment. And you're describing stuff we talk about and think about all the time and why we're really, really focusing in this world of high equity prices, tight credit spreads, You know, finding ways to generate similar returns, similar income without taking that type of economic sensitivity or not needing to rely on policymakers coming to the rescue every time you have a negative growth shock. As a bond investor, you're always thinking about the downside. Another thing that's elevated today are geopolitical risks. How do you think about that, and how do you factor in this big unknown? One is, you know, back to this humility point. Um, when we all went to school to learn the stuff we're, we're, we're doing today, you know, they didn't really teach us how to, you know, we did some cash flow analysis and things, but, um, you know, derivative pricing, but didn't really, you know, teach us easily on how to incorporate this geopolitical risk. So I think you need 
you know, independent outside advisors to help um, assess probabilities in this arena. You also need to look at these types of shocks and realize that the best cash flows out there in the world can uh, become quite impaired in a world of this significant geopolitical uncertainty. War, um, unanticipated political decisions that can impact the economic and regulatory climate um, where your uh, investment is situated, sanctions uh, tied to geopolitical concerns uh, can change the nature of prudent portfolio diversification. Um, so all these factors are, are very, very important. Um, and what we're doing, again, we have a dedicated uh, outside global advisory board of accomplished uh, individuals with tremendous experience and perspective uh, across geopolitical issues around the globe. It's also nice because they're independent and we try to allow them to maintain their independence so they're not influenced by internal PIMCO discourse. They can give us very, very clear and ob objective views. And then also doing a lot more scenario analysis around geopolitical uncertainty and trying to understand and think about diversification in this new, more uncertain world that we live in where it's just it can't just be ge geographic. It has to be tied to political alignment, um, other sources of strain and stress. Um, I think what we've ended up with are, you know, perhaps less concentrated positions, geopolitical overrides where we may like a cash flow in isolation or an investment in isolation, but because we can't get comfortable with other forms of uncertainty, we require a higher yield that may not be there and therefore we we say no. And then just spending a lot more time on these issues um, and, and, and realizing that, that, that these issues are going to be much more influential, we think, over the next several years than they were in calmer times. Uh, do you have any particular concerns about the upcoming election and how, how are you thinking about that? Well, it's going to probably be a volatility uh, inducing event. Um, what's going to matter a lot is the, 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 the mandate that either party gets, meaning um, if you know, Biden or his replacement uh, were, you know, remain in the, in the White House, uh, the Democrats have control of one or both houses of Congress uh, in a clean Republican sweep. There's going to be a lot more policy policy flexibility. In a macro sense, we think that that probably means um, a bit more pressure on deficits, perhaps at least over the near term, uh, a bit more pressure on inflation, steeper curves, more volatility. And of course, with, with Trump, a lot more, you know, global policy uncertainty. So uh, we think, you know, at a minimum, this could be a volatility type event, an event that leads to some major shifts in both absolute and relative valuations. Now, what are we doing? It's still early to predict, you know, ultimate outcomes. Uh, probabilities have certainly shifted for appropriate reasons over the course of the last few weeks, but we're very excited that we're going into this period with um, a lot more liquidity than we've typically had, uh, more of an up in quality um, bias across portfolios. And with up in quality tends to come more liquidity and li with liquidity, you have more portfolio flexibility. And we're not doing this just because we're concerned, oh my God, we got, you know, a Trump-Biden rematch or something close to that perhaps. Uh, it's more that the market setup has allowed us to maintain attractive yields and attractive portfolio positioning while increasing uh, liquidity. So uh, we're not quite sure how things play out. The tails are certainly fatter than they usually are um, you know, around um, accepting election results, noise around um, an election, a contested uncertain outcome to this election. And again, it's not just the United States. Uh, we have um, some political trends and uncertainty across Europe. Uh, we still have war in Europe. We got uh, French election uncertainty, a surprising outcome um, on, on the election side in Mexico more recently. So I think in general, you know, expect more surprises, more volatility tied to some of these more idiosyncratic type uh, election issues. So, so that's what we're doing is, is uh, not, not ready to place big chips down yet in terms of who wins and impact on different sectors or segments of the market. But um, I think we have some positions on that are consistent with a more clear, forceful election outcome. And then if there's volatility, um, as long as it's not too significant, would actually welcome that because I think it will be, would give us an opportunity to use some of that liquidity to generate some, some client value. Yeah, and basically, given the underlying risks geopolitically and also within you know our country, uh, you basically require a larger margin of safety to to take the risk, and and essentially what that could do if the market's not offering that is to put you in a more defensive position that you could that you gives you the dry powder to take advantage of potential opportunities. That's correct. And then back to the point we talked about earlier, when. You know, spreads are tight when equity valuations are full, when the implied uh, probability of hard landings is low, be patient. 
and be willing to give up a little bit of incremental return, go up in cap structure, up in quality, buy things with government guarantees, agency guarantees. Um, and that's, I think, the, the, the key of active asset management are finding ways to find proxies out there in the market that can generate attractive income where you're not giving up too much by being defensive um, and still maintain flexibility to add um, to positions when valuations become more attractive. So that's the mode and the mindset that we're in currently going into this election period or just in general, given where, um, where valuations are currently. Uh, one of the risks, uh, we've talked about default risks, yeah. but one of the risks that bond investors face is inflation. And if we just look at what is discounted in markets, the markets are pretty confident inflation is going to go at least closer to its 2% target. Uh, how do you think about investing in tips given that risk and uh, and where markets are pricing? Yeah, tips are a nice asset. Um, and you're absolutely right. For all the chatter about you know central banks being late, Powell being late, people losing confidence in the Fed, when you look at break evens, you look at the fact that you know equity valuations are at you know all time highs or near all time highs after last you know a few days. Uh, credit spreads are very very tight. Still a lot of confidence in central banks being able to engineer positive economic uh, and financial market outcomes, including getting inflation back down uh, to target. So we own tips. I didn't look at them today, but we we're at around two point two percent the other day. We had even dipped a little bit below that, uh, and that's CPI inflation. So. As I'd mentioned earlier, we think that inflation will likely structurally be, be higher on a structural basis uh, over the next several years, and inflation volatility will be materially greater than it was pre-COVID. And you get to buy an asset that protects against um, higher inflation um, without having to pay much premium, if any premium at all. And then at the moment, when you look at our forecast for inflation versus what's implied in the tips market, there's pretty good value in the very front end of the yield curve as well. Uh, it's a bit more of a technical trade, but from time to time, uh, the tips market's nice because you can isolate a very specific headline inflation view and lock in that view versus what's priced into the tips curve. We happen to be in that environment um, over the last several weeks where we're beginning to do more of that as well. But we think tips are great. They're uh, a nice asset to own. We own them, uh, even though I didn't in this podcast mention. Oh God, a deep concern is inflation. You know, reaccelerating. It's a risk. Yeah, it seems, there seems to be some asymmetry there. If you think about the odds and inflation surprises below what's yeah. discounted versus above, it seems like the odds are tilted heavily in favor of inflation surprising to the upside. I think that's right, and. Um, it's a nice asset class. It's actually an interesting one. It's a bit out of favor in the sense that a lot of people bought tips thinking that they would protect, bu buying tips in isolation because they'd protect against an inflationary environment. And we know that um, in a tip, you have the real rate exposure, then you have the inflation um, break-even exposure. So yes, they've helped on the like the, the inflation side, but of course, to get inflation under control, central banks have to take real rates up a lot. So you lost money on, on, on a tip. You wouldn't have if you did it hedged with a treasury. So you actually have this interesting technical dynamic in the market where tips aren't a particularly loved asset class at the moment. In fact, a lot of people that bought tips when inflation was really high are selling. I think that's one of the reasons why you have this nice situation where despite the fact that inflation risks are elevated, you still can buy these instruments at pretty low longer term break even rates. So I think that they're the great you know investment. You, you know you don't overthink it. You have a core allocation, and you just you know you own it. You hope they don't have to outperform a lot, um, but if they do, it, it it means that other areas of your portfolio probably aren't doing so well. So uh, we think it's a really nice asset class, and we uh, we're, we're we're in the trade. So if we look forward five to ten years, and you were to compare high quality bonds to equities, you mentioned equities are pretty richly valued. Um, how do those compare on a absolute return basis and also on a risk adjusted basis? Yes, yeah, so I'm glad you said five or ten years because um, you know all these longer term valuation met, you know frameworks don't don't necessarily work very well over the short term. And uh, you know equity markets have a lot of momentum. There's a lot of innovation. Again, I'm bond guy tend to be more negative, but this AI innovation is exciting, at least in a macro sense, although I'll have a reason to be negative on that in a second too. But, um, you know, bottom line to answer your question, um, those types of returns, you know, with these yields where we are today, when you go out there and look at yields where they are today versus equity valuations where they are under a Schiller P or some type of, you know, equity risk premium type framework, uh, you would expect bonds to do very well relative to equities on a go-forward basis. In fact, there's a lot of scenarios that would suggest that you could actually out-return equities over the next five to 10 years. You certainly 
are in a position where it's highly likely that you will have a materially better risk-adjusted returns um, than uh, you've had in, in in many many years. And again, simple math, as I said earlier, is that you know, over a five-year period, you know, you buy a high-quality bond portfolio in, in in default remote cash flows, and you can generate a mid to high single-digit return. Those have been historically pretty good returns for equity markets, and you know, up there um, at at current PE ratios. Um, you have a real good you, you have real good odds of of um, of, of doing uh, quite well. Same is true versus cash as well. Cash is still the highest yield on the board, but similar arguments here now that you know investors you know at these you know high real and nominal rates should be locking in uh, some higher returns as well. On the uh, not to get off on a tangent on the AI side, but just one point there. You know AI is a very exciting technology. It could lead to a sustained period of higher productivity. It could drive earnings growth for many many years. But the more productivity enhancing AI is, the more disruptive it may be as a technology as well. So back from a bond investor's perspective, someone that's making decisions within the corporate credit space, uh, what may be good for the economy more broadly may not be so good for old economy corporates that are being disrupted. So you know, I think AI is an exciting technology that we do think will likely have a material macro impact over the longer run in the form of potentially higher productivity, higher real rates, all else equal. It also can be quite disruptive and another argument for much more careful and active credit selection um, in remaining nimble in the market because this stuff's changing very, very quickly. And you know, with that, um, you can see sectors that look well-protected all of a sudden become less well-protected as this AI technology shifts and as you begin to see winners and losers and the impact of that um, exciting technology. Yeah, you definitely want to lend to the winners, not the losers. Yeah, or if there's too high a stakes as to whether you are the winner or the loser, step back and require more risk premium. So yeah, absolutely agree with agree with that. And what do you think about real estate lending? As many of the traditional lenders have stepped away, maybe there's more opportunity there to get a yield above the risk on a relative basis. Well, it's great. Uh, it's, it's a very exciting area of the market. It, it's a great opportunity over the course of the next few years, let me be clear. There is more strain and stress in the real estate markets, both debt and equity, than may be suggested by current valuations, because we know these valuations are sticky. And when you look at public proxies around what cap rates should be, um, there's still this massive gap. And that gap needs to close one way or another. Uh, and that's going to lead to attractive opportunities. So for, with a fresh balance sheet uh, and a focus on the more resilient sectors and segments of the market, it's a great opportunity um, for investors. Multifamily is a great example, um, the biggest area of the commercial real estate lending markets. Uh, phenomenal long-term fundamentals, just like single-family housing. Uh, all the post-GFC regulations not only made it hard to lend against homes, uh, it's also made it hard to build. Um, so we haven't built enough units relative to household formation on a national basis. Unfortunately, we've built too much in some of the cities that were seeing a lot of the inward um, migration. So the Sunbelt multifamily now is going through a, 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 a period of strain because we built too much the last few years. Once we get through that period, and there's gonna be some challenges in that space, um, on a national basis, you know, very, very you know, attractive long-term structural tailwinds. So one of the most exciting areas that, that we see, and you don't have to do it in the office space or the weak retail sector. You can do it there and get some real eye-popping returns, but you can do it in areas that are going through um, a short-term period of pain because of the rate shock and overbuilding, uh, and we think generate very, very attractive risk-adjusted returns. We're doing it in the private um, side of our business, also doing it on a targeted basis in some of our more liquid strategies as well. Uh, well, we've covered a wide range of topics today, uh, including AI, which has been uh, pretty interesting. Uh, why don't we close with, uh, if you have any uh, unique investment insights uh, that you'd like to share with our audience? I don't know how, how unique they are, but you know, there's lots of um, talk out there today of golden ages and you know trends in markets. And what I've said is, you know, I, I think 2022 was a horrible period. Um, everything went down, and bonds were meant to protect. When other things went down, bonds, you know, for 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 a long time, you know, went up. But it was a rough period because everything went down. And I think in the process, people discovered the wonders of non-mark to market accounting. Uh, it's great even emotionally when some, when a price doesn't doesn't move. So, you know, we just think we're in a world today where um, when you step back and think about simple and basic asset allocation decisions, you can go all the way back to the the last crisis. Regulators don't like bailing out the same entities twice. 
Uh, that's why we've had massive regulation on banks, massive regulations across the mortgage and the consumer lending space. When you're investing um, as a credit investor or a, or a fixed income investor, it's great to target over-regulated sectors, sectors that haven't allowed to grow, sectors that you know where excess hasn't been allowed to build. It's right out in front of you, lend to those types of entities. And then when you look on the flip side, areas that may have benefited from sticky marks, benefited from um, this very, very go-go economy uh, supported by one of the bis biggest fiscal responses we've seen in history, where you see significant growth, weaker covenants, lending to lower quality companies that will get in trouble if you stay higher for longer and you have any type of earnings shock. Um, the, th the, the areas talked about the most, where there's the most, I guess, perceived enthusiasm are areas where you want to be a little bit more cautious. So sometimes um, these markets are quite complicated. Sometimes the simple, basic, obvious asset allocation decision is sitting right, right in front of you. So I think that there's a lot going on in the world, lots of uncertainty. Does inflation come down? Does the Fed cut? How much do they cut? all the geopolitical noise and uncertainty, but sometimes there's just very, very simple and basic asset allocation decisions investors can make. And I think lend to the consumer, be cautious about lower quality, you know, floating rate corporate borrowers is one of the most obvious ones I've seen. And then lots of interesting things to do in the middle. And then the other one is again, just, um, you know, humility, patience, humility, patience, long-term orientation, uh, take what the market gives you just to reiterate a few, uh, few lessons I learned along the way, um, you know, from uh, mentors and colleagues at, at PIMCO and, uh, and across the industry. This is great, Dan. I appreciate your, your time and for sharing your insights with us. Thanks, really appreciate you, uh, you having me on the show. Thanks for listening. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please visit our website at insightfulinvestor.org to access past shows and learn more about our podcast. If you have questions, feel free to email us at info at insightfulinvestor.org. And if you enjoyed the discussion, please subscribe to this podcast to ensure you don't miss future episodes. And don't forget to forward today's conversation to others you think would enjoy listening. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as legal, business, investment, or tax advice. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinions and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Evoke Advisors, their affiliates, or companies featured. Due to industry regulations, participants on this podcast are instructed not to make specific trade recommendations, nor reference past or potential profits. And listeners are reminded that securities trading, commodity trading, and alternative investments are complex and carry a risk of substantial losses. As such, they are not suitable for all investors. Listeners should be aware that guests featured on The Insightful Investor may have current or past associations with Evoke Advisors or the host, including as an investment manager of a private fund opportunity by Evoke, or access through an affiliated Evoke fund, or as a client. Participation as a guest on the podcast should not be perceived as an endorsement or testimonial with respect to Evoke Advisors, the podcast host, or their services. Similarly, the inclusion of a guest on the podcast does not imply that Evoke Advisors or the host endorses the guest or any company with which they may be affiliated or employed. Evoke has neither paid nor received compensation from guests for their participation.